history and kind of start at the beginning of the painting itself. Um, putting together Ruth's ret first ret retrospective at MOA, we got really deep into looking at the early works in New York, which was shocking to me because I was really only familiar with her work that was made in California and since she had moved to California, that, that the ideas and that the concepts were already there. I mean, we look at this work and we assume, oh, this came on to her as she came to California and the light in California and um, kind of trends in painting and experience. But when I saw the work from New York and said, oh, this already existed, and we started talking about, you know, the light in New York and that this whole idea of light and space genre did not just pop out of California like there was no other light anywhere else in the world, but she was already dealing with this like well before um, the, this work. And I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. How do you talk about that? Um, no, I think that's great, Edward. Thank you for the lovely introduction and really excited to be here with Andy who's been following the work for um, over a decade as well. Um, that's a wonderful place to start because, it, interestingly enough, I've always been focused on the phenomena of color and the relativity of color and perception. And the work in New York, it was a more analytical approach. I also think that the subtlety of the exploration uh, which lent itself to more post-war color field and minimalism and certainly those were strong influences of mine growing up in New York and also uh, during my time uh, in, at Cooper Union for my BFA. It, there was a, an appreciation for the work that was received in California in an entirely different perspective. Whereas in New York, I was sort of exhibited with monochrome painters, and they were never about that. Um, uh, I felt that how the work was perceived was really through an understanding of a more visceral experience, a palpable experience of space and light, and how seamlessly the alignment of the light and space movement and that understanding and perspective on my work just seemed a perfect fit in sort of incorporating it into my exhibitions and historically in California. And the change, and I've seen a couple of changes, they're very subtle, but recognizable when you follow the work from the beginning. Um, I think uh, there was a body of work that you did, I want to say around 2007, uh -huh. um, that was gray, yeah. and, but it wasn't gray, uh, right. but everyone perceived this whole body of work as being these large gray paintings, and um, until you actually stood in front of them and started to have a relationship with them, they were absolutely about color, um, and they were about what happens when you are looking at these these paintings that are supposedly without color, and you see every color relationship that happens in the rainbow in these great paintings. They were really fantastic. I think I even wrote about them uh, for a magazine. But the, um, to see the transition from the work in New York, where obviously the palette was not this vibrant, mm -hmm. but it was um, New York light and New York palette, and then ha having that kind of transition into those gray paintings, and then to now watch the color feel, the color work in this, and the relationship between the colors and in, in these that are obvious about a palette and obvious about a specific color and what that color does next to itself. Right. Not just the, the relationship, right. the relativity. Right. Well, you're interesting, you're, Andy, you're uh, touching on a few very important influences and principles that I deal with in all my work over the past 35 years, and that is the three complementary color systems. So I have focused all and every body of work on the austerity of the three complementary color systems, red, green, blue, orange, yellow, violet, and 
interestingly enough, my research uh, when I was at Hunter College led me to Michelle Eugene Chevrol, a 18th century chemist's research, and he was actually the one who discovered the observation of simultaneous contrast through the need to help repair tapestries. And interestingly, when you use complementary colors, when you juxtapose them to each other, the relationships can really heighten the drama and the uh, context of color. But when you intermix them, you really can get these very subtle and muted down and nameless tones. And it's only until they're in relationship with a color that you can name and identify that you can see that. So with the gray work, it's oh, the gray series paintings, which are ongoing. It's sort of this, um, when you mix the intensity of pure color, all the way to the center and you get the, that merging, you really can lose all color. It appears that you can, but those paintings were really based on another um, uh, sensibility of my work and that's that you have to take the time. They're slow and so when you first see them you might think that you can understand them but because they're based on opticality um, and also perception as your eyes adjust to the phenomena of the object itself the light in the room the time of day the season they actually change and i have had uh, dear collectors share with me that they love the work when they saw it in the gallery. And then after the closing of the show, when the work was finally installed, and the light was changing, and they got to experience this, that the painting just has these dynamic relationships that change because of the context of the light. They have their own light, but also the visual and optical relationship in the room also changes their appearance and what is sort of more forefront and sort of that intense, vibrant optical relationship. And we think about that when we think about those relationships and those changes in not necessarily painting because we think painting is so static, but we think about it in terms of um, like fabricated sculpture and and uh, machined works and things where there's where that is the intent of the piece is to have this like optical change and to kind of the gimmick of the piece itself. And I think that's what's so unusual about your work is that that you've been able to achieve that with paint when it's there's nothing mechanized about it. It is your body and your physical hand with paint making these, um, making the paint perform in a way that n normally a mechanized, manufactured or fabricated piece or sculpture might do. And I think that's what sets these apart from like say all of the light, the light and space, space artists who do not have their hand in their work and that it is fabricated and it ha it's, it's, a, it's meant to have the, the artist's hand removed because it's supposed to be so pure. Mm -hmm. But I, I find that the opposite. I find that the painting is more pure and that the, your hand in it and the humanity that goes along with making that makes them even more appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're able to create that, that optical re response and relationship that normally comes with some kind of mechanized or fabricated work. We've spoken about the, I mean, paint is really matter, it's physical. So I think the, um, my awe with painting is that when I first touch the canvas with a loaded wet brush, that that first strokes, that it is a dark, you know, swipe and stroke of paint, whatever color it is, on a white ground. And my fascination with my process is that the more I build up the physicality of the object itself, of painting the surfaces, I dissolve and resolve the matter of paint into luminosity, into light, and into this um, optical 
and ethereality that is more associated with the light and space movement and working with new materials and but where paint isn't necessarily translucent or transparent it can be extremely opaque and um, I think my fascination with working with color um, is that um, I can manipulate it and it's a journey it's a journey to find the luminosity and um, and I don't know how these are going to appear the, in in their final resolution I do have predetermined systems that I begin each painting and each series with. My interests are that these predetermined systems are quite simple. It's a color system, a format of the canvas, whether square, vertical, or horizontal, and then that's always in juxtaposition to the spontaneity of painting and they offset each other and there's that wonderful reciprocality where I'm on a journey and I don't know the outcome. I never know what the end result is going to be and for this particular body of work, uh, the banding um, has become quite uh, strong in some respects and then quite subtle in others. So sort of this uh, color field uh, with definable forms and how this is, it's always in a state of flux and movement between that. And if you don't know already, she does not use an airbrush. This is all done with a paintbrush. Um, and if you have any, in, any of you painters out there understand what that means, like this isn't, this is, this is not something that you can just, oh, I'm gonna, you know, paint a line and then brush out the, uh, the edges or soften it. It's every one of these colors comes from the interrelationship between three or four or five or six other colors that have already been put down. Right. And um, I've had the privilege of being in her studio when she's worked. It is the most physical and rigorous process I've ever seen. Um, her entire body is in, and I, I can't even mimic you, but I mean, literally, she is using her whole body to apply this paint. And it is a pleasure to watch you work. That's, That's exactly. I mean, I'm like, makes me tired to watch you. But, uh, <laughs> they are very cathartic. I mean, you because of their the ultimate refinement. You might think the process is a very delicate right. and tender. These are so muscular. I mean, I, it is a physical an intellectual and cathartic workout. I'm constantly uh, monitoring not only my complementary color systems, and as Andy touched upon, each layer is a complete layer, so everything is in relationship to everything else. And so you change one thing, whether it's a measurement, or a stroke, it simultaneously, it's the domino effect and it changes everything else. And so it's kind of like the cat in the hat, you've got it all going on simultaneously. And it's not until I see them happening optically that I realize that they're telling me they're done. And so it's very rewarding uh, and wonderful experience to get to that place where they start defining themselves and I just back off and facilitate. I decided to revisit the powder chalk medium, uh, not thinking it was going to be a summer, gentle, easy project. And I got so enthralled with what I was seeing going on that it ended up lasting a year and a half. And I remember Edward came to visit I hadn't quite thought ahead that I was going to make that many or how to care for them or protect them. They were just lining the floor like a sea of color. And uh, what was thrilling about this was that the, all the work is organically in transition. I don't decide that these 
pieces are going to have banding or not banding, but the banding came back to the work after I had been heightening the edges and the physical relationship to the painting object itself and really wanting to assert the object, which is also why I designed the bevel stretcher bar. I wanted to release the optical and perceptual experience from the wall and the side, that white edge of the canvas structure had no relevance to what I was realizing in the paintings and I saw with uh, the minimalist object how important everything is, how crucial relationship to the object is and I realized the beveled stretcher would not only release it from the wall and enhance the shadow play and the luminosity within the painting, um, but it also got rid of this irrelevance uh, from the object itself. And to go back, um, the powder chalk medium being powders and not aqueous like oil paint, I wasn't able to facilitate some of these nuanced transitions that I can on canvas. And I thought, not only am I, am I going to go with this, but I saw how this could come back into painting. I never had imagined that or expected it, and I was thinking I was just going to contain that to these pastel paint, uh, works. And lo and behold, it just started to generate this heightened opticality in the painting and developed uh, the banding which you're seeing today in, in this body of work. Um, you also mentioned um, something about I have been focused on working in series um, and the serial relationship is so important to the foundation of my work and how I advance not only paintings, but the relationship of that series as a whole. And that has really led to, um, you know, diptychs and triptychs, uh, uh, quartets, which are inseparable and really share the exploration of my philosophical interests, um, but also in fleshing out um, the uniqueness of each piece in the context of that greater relationship of the series itself. And that lends itself to site-specific installation, uh, which is something I'm also very excited about. And even though I know with a gallery ex exhibition, I am very involved in thinking about the scale of the work, the format of the work, the dynamics across the room, the curation of the room as the whole, and um, how that actually um, facilitates the greater experience of the show, and also site-specific installation, which I'm excited to continue, and was really honored to receive a permanent installation at Ernst & Young Plaza of eight large-scale vertical paintings which are on view if you get down uh, to the financial district and something that I am currently working towards again um, for another site-specific large-scale project. Um, super excited about that. It, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, an excuse for us to do another museum show. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Let's 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 shake on yeah, that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far I want we have the book out, but as far as um, it's interesting because the the works photograph really well, but they but we can't have the relationship like we have when we stand in front of one or we live with it and see it evolve it, during the day with the light changing. I mean, this is a nice record, and videos are a nice record of like your process and what you do. And um, and but the, as far as the objects themselves, they're so personal. They're so your hand is in every minute of it. You're you, you're looking at it as a viewer, um, having this relationship with color. We all have favorite colors that we respond to, 
Um, and for me, I, I mean, I have my own favorite colors, but every single one of your paintings, I feel like I have a relationship with. And it's, I'm sure that you do, because you're literally blood, sweat, and tears go into every single painting, but um, it's hard to have that relationship from the printed, from the book. Totally agree. Yeah. And I, I do feel that, um, you know, uh, even less so the printed image, the, I, I think, digital images uh, might give a better indication just because the digital screen offers some luminosity which parallels the end result of the paintings itself. But I think it's a testimony to the fact that these works are based on the phenomena of color perception and the relativity and that it's not static. That it is something that you cannot capture in a single image. That, that what happens, how they open up, how some relationships create the opportunity for the experience of deep enveloping space while others, same relationships, create this sense of this sort of exuding uh, light that, that's emanating and, and some of them have this sort of combustion frigid. They, they almost appear like they're fluorescent light fixtures that are just sort of humming. I think there are musical um, parallels uh, that really have a poetic relationship to how I feel when I'm working, the notes and the spaces. That it's not just about hitting that color note, but it's about the spaces between the notes that really start to create almost this environment and this singularity of experience. And I certainly do, I, they're all like um, children. You know, and, and you just hope for the best when they go out into the world, sort of like stones. And what ripple effects will they will they make? Um, um, but each one is also almost like this um, charged, impacted time capsule right. of the entire experience. Because if you were to see the beginnings, I start out. I'm more of an abstract expressionist painter in the beginning, and it's so liberating to just touch that canvas and start out so raw, so open-ended. Um, I wouldn't do it if I knew the end result. I mean, it's thrilling to just sort of see how the compilation of all these strokes and different strokes and how they start amassing and they create uh, these environments, optical, visceral, perceptual, and wonderful about what you said about having favorite color. Uh, you know, I'm also drawn to favorite colors, and but it changes. It does, um, yeah. And and I have had um, many people say to me, I love your blue work. You know, I'm just so drawn to your blue paintings. And the blues and the reds are probably um, my most um, known uh, color systems that I've explored. They're the dominant primary colors, the most saturated of the three primary colors. Um, but interesting, when you get in front of them, I had a, a colleague say, I just love those blue paintings. I have to come and see them. She couldn't take her eyes off this orange painting. She's like, I can't believe it. I had the same response. I wanted to. The orange painting. I wanted a blue painting of yours. I've been dreaming about owning and having. And when it came down to finally making her selection, I had these, this orange painting. And she was like, I, I, I am stumped. But it's the something about that particular painting, that light, yeah. that I, I can't like get away from. Yeah. And she was so, I, I, it's interesting how um, I really recommend don't bring your preconceived notions 
to an experience, sure. I'm always um, dumbfounded at what I discover in the process and what happens and what I learn about color after all these years, what I learned about exploring color and light and the same color systems and how each time they open up an entirely new body of work. So um, that's, a, and, and, and how it is very personal. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one, one writer wrote that they kind of remind him of tuning forks and how when you're, you know, in front of each one, there's a different relationship, right. physically, right. Um, how you feel. Oh, and it's it. not just a visual thing either. Like yeah. you were talking about the humming. I feel that with the work, and sometimes that vibration, not just the visual vibration, but the, the physical vibration. And, and the sound of right, it. Right, the sound of it. Right. The level, sort of the timber. Yeah. Some are just higher, some are lower, and so although I, I, I don't play music, I'm fascinated with the notion of centuries of all this different music coming from these finite number of notes and how I deal with that. I love that notion of that my finite systems actually are the opportunity to explore limitless potential. And that's one of the fundamental principles I begin each series with and each painting with. That I am beginning with these set points, but where I will go will be a whole different journey and exploration. And that is the beauty, I think, of this work too, is that you will never be able to make the same painting twice. Right. Right? They're so True. unique They're in so the unique. moment of the application of the paint and what happens when the paint, when those colors come together or when a certain brush size stroke comes together and changes the angle at which the light touches the canvas and reflects back. Like you can never recreate that. It'll always, it'll always be a different painting. So you, you can't just have a blue Ruth Pastine painting. They're, so they're all is, different. They're all, every single one is different. <laughs> that would be a wonderful yeah. survey. Just right. all the blues yeah. so over the over the years. Yeah. No, you're you're so no, right. No two are alike. The, it's almost like an accordion. The the compression and the expansion of the same information has a totally different dynamic. For this exhibition, I actually started on two square paintings, which I completed and I thought were going to be one of these walls. And as I was working and towards, you know, the completion of the show, I realized that I had kind of gone beyond those two initial paintings, that I had to let go of what I had already discovered there and it, this show became about the energy and the relationship of the verticality and the horizontal, mm -hmm. and how it's sort of these polarizing opposites or complements. I really wanted that notion of, of the equilateral cross, uh, which um, uh, Kazmir Malevich explored, one of my heroes, and Four years ago, my show, sort of in honor of a hundred year anniversary of suprematism, the show was not only focused on solely the square, but I generated the new square diamond paintings, right. at, which you are exhibiting right. Right. Um, at MOA right now in LA painting. Today. Thank you all for coming.